Tom Springer, he writes many different things. He writes grants for the Kellogg Foundation, which is a totally alien kind of language that is exactly like that, really boring. And he writes really interesting essays about what he loves, which is nature and his family. Oh, and wondering. He writes a lot about wondering, and I think a lot of his writing is born out of wonder. Not wonder like, wow, that's cool, some of that, but wonder like, what the hell is that? So it's both those things. So anyway, I will turn this over to you. He'll probably talk and stuff for about an hour. If they have questions, should they ask them immediately? Yeah, or ask, them while they're fresh. ask your question while it's hot, okay? Here's Tom Springer. Thank you. Good morning. You know, my path to being a writer had started in a room a little bit like this. It was over at Cal Cal Campbell's of Valley Community College. I think one of the things I didn't understand when I was starting out about being a writer, I assumed that if you want to be a writer, it's like you have to take a certain amount of courses, you have to write a certain amount of books, you have to certain write amount of stories. And then all of a sudden, at some point, somebody will say, oh, you're a writer now, right? You know, as if, as if you sort of get the stamp of approval, you get some degree, and it makes you a writer. But what I realize now, looking back, is that I was a writer from the time that I can remember, you know, being a little kid. I think being a writer is more about the way you look at the world. It's about the, the, your love of stories and language. It's about how you view yourself, the connection to other people, and what and how you use writing to make sense of you. So in that sense, being a writer is a vocation that you start whenever you say you want to be a writer. And I'm not trying to oversimplify things, but you know, I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, just a little bit about my background. I'll tell you how that came to be. I did not start out being anybody who's going to go to college. Nobody in my family went to college, and uh, I certainly wasn't going to college because when I graduated from high school, I had a 1.9 GPA, just like C minus. Okay, 1.9 GPA, and uh, you know, I, I, I grew up in a small town. You know, my dad was a barber, um, and I assumed that if I thought about you know the future any farther ahead, than maybe a week or two or the next weekend. Now, I mean, you get out of school, I'm get a factory job or a construction job, and I'm just be happy, right? And uh, so that was sort of my plan. But uh, I, I, I started to try to do some of those things, and I was pretty, really dangerously inept. I tried to be a heat refrigeration mechanic, and I was like burning myself, and I was electrocuting myself. I was trying to run power tools, you know, and I, I had some bad experience with those because what writers tend to do, they let their minds wander, okay? In power tools, like if you have, a, if you have, you have the uh, switch on, it's still going to feel the same if your mind is wandering or not. So anyway, I sort of fumbled around with that, and finally, out of desperation, at age 24, I decided to uh, go to Camel Valley Community College. I was going to study heating and air conditioning, right? Because that's that's what that's what the the advice I got from my dad was to learn a trade. That's good advice, you know, for somebody that, that uh, doesn't mind losing a few fingers because they don't know how they're running the operating power tools. But uh, uh, but what happened was during that uh, first year at school, I think I was 24, 25. I um, had to take uh, anybody here in a freshman writing class or freshman composition class. Okay, that's a class you have to take, right? I mean, you have to take that as part of your curriculum. And I took that class, and uh, I turned in some papers. And what they were a lot like, what they were actually were little essays, the type of things you're doing now, where somebody will say a writing experience about your. You know, write a story about your life and there's different sort of criteria things that we do. And these essays I turned in, you know, my teacher said, these are pretty good. You know, you ought to think about being a writer. And at the time, I thought That's, that was like hilarious, you know, because, um, you know, writer, again, I was thinking somebody who's, you know, novels, whatever, or books or screenplays or something that was way up here. And I didn't really see any connection between a writer and somebody who got a good grade on a freshman composition course at Campbell's Valley like Community College and a writer who's like famous had books in a bookstore. That just seemed like way too big of a leap to make. But uh, in the back of my mind, obviously, anytime you get positive feedback, which I had very little at that point in my academic career, it was about the first time I heard that, you know, that gets your attention. And uh, so as I as I finally got my two year degree and went out in the uh, world of heating air conditioning to commit even more mayhem destroy more equipment and to, you know, sort of uh, inflict more pain and blisters and cuts and whatever on my body, you know, when that didn't work out and I would mysteriously get laid off from jobs, I'd say, okay, 
you know, I'm 27 now, you know, I, this other thing is not working out, you know, I'm not going to live to adulthood if I keep working in this field, you know, because there's like really, really poisonous gas and high voltage and oxyacetylene, of course, there's things that mess you up. And uh, for those with a wandering mind, again, this is not, it's not uh, healthy to be around that stuff. So, on the sense of failure almost, I decided to go back to uh, Western Michigan University, which was the closest school nearby, and uh, started to get a degree in something called communications, which is just a totally vague field, right? It means just about anything you want to be. And, uh, but within that, within that, I found the things I did best on about writing. And, uh, you know, writing is basically just taking your ideas and putting them in an organized form and telling a story and put them, them, them. So, um, I ended up pursuing a career in writing. And uh, this, this flag here is again. This yours okay? I have one. There it is right over here. And, uh, and, uh, so, it, like I said, my mind left. So anyway, so, so I, I'm a Western. I'm getting a degree in this vague field called communications. And they have a specialty in something called public relations. And public relations basically means you do writing for like on behalf of a company, you know, try to make the company look good. And I got a job at uh, Borges Medical Center in the public relations department as an internship. And I was writing these, they had this newsletter that came out that brought about maybe 50 people would ever read. But it was totally exciting to me because here I was in this hospital, you know, doing this thing, getting paid to write stories, you know, and I'd go up and meet these little sick kids in the cancer ward and Santa would come in. I mean, it was very dramatic stuff. And it gave me such a wonderful sort of sense of, uh, I don't know, sense of belonging that I could do something with, with this ability that I had. And that, that, that's where it sort of really took off there for me. But it's interesting because um, I, I, mentioned, I mentioned earlier about not seeing myself as a writer, but what I found out from when I took that freshman composition course was all the, all the books that I read, you know, all the experience that I've had, all the ways I've thought about things, it all came into play. So that sense of being a writer, again, that starts right now if you want to do that. I mean, I don't think you, you don't have to wait for somebody to tell you you're a writer. A writer is somebody who takes, to me, it takes extra care in how they express themselves. They take, take extra care in making sure that they read things that really feed, feed their mind, feed their soul, you know, and, and, and help them make meaning in the world. You know, a writer is somebody who, um, you know, when they put things on paper, it helps them make more sense to the world. It helps them make more sense to themselves. So, you know, if from that standpoint alone, I think writing could be a very powerful tool in your life. And having, and it, having being a writer, part of your, part of your personality, part of your personal job description is very important. You know, uh, thank you. And I won't lose this one. Nobody has a one. <laughs> Last summer, we were going through some stuff in my house that, as an example, I got married in 1995. We took this trip out west, my wife and I, on our honeymoon. And uh, she had a little notebook that she, that she, we would take turns uh, taking notes in there of where we went, where we stayed, who we talked to, you know, some of the sort of uh, really uh, just basic little, little facts and details. But it was interesting. When I read that notebook from that, from that two weeks we were out west, a bunch of memories came to mind then all of a sudden I could see where we were. I could see where we ate, this little place where we stopped, see the old guy we ran on the side of the road who found out we were just married and gave us a bunch of apples in Colorado. And, and what it really made me remember is, or it, what pointed out to me, the act of writing, of putting something down on paper, it seems to make a connection to our lives, to uh, our sense of understanding, nothing else, nothing else does, because Actually, those memories, it's still, they had still been in my head, right? That stuff was all still up there, okay? But somehow, I put it down on paper, and by reading those notes again, you know, just this stuff written on a page, you know, almost 20 years ago, all that came back to life. Now, I don't have, you know, if, if you think of any sort of, like, two-week period from your life, unless it was some really extreme big thing going on, you wouldn't have those type of memories, okay? But the fact that I could somehow, by reading that again, brought that all back very clear, it's very powerful. It's like, wow. You know, I wish I had that for, you know, there's periods of my life I'd like to forget, but for the most part, you know, I kind of I kind of wish I, I would have that clarity and that, that kind of sense of recall for everything else. So I think I think of nothing else, though, one of the things that I started out that really helped me was to keep a journal, and I know, I know you hear that a lot, keep a journal, that's what writers are supposed to do, but for me it was something that I did when I was going through an experience, whether at work or some relationship thing, 
you know, some girl issue or whatever, that, that, it, that I wrote it down and kept track of it. I realized that once it was on, on the page, it sort of helped me order things. It helped me make sense of my work. You know, it's sort of, you take what is in your head and all sort of floating around, and when you write, you know, very active writing means you have to put some things in some kind of order, right? You have to put a bit of sequence where they're logical and make sense. And I found that really helped me. And uh, at a tough time, I break up with my girlfriend and all that stuff and you guys have all been through. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hey, when you, when you do stuff like that, do you find it hard to put the little memory down? You know, when you find it hard to put it in words, man, right? that makes sense. You try to put down the memories. You, you, mean, you mean after something just happened or, or looking back? I want you look back on You know, I mean, I, you may have fond memories of certain things. You find it hard to put it in your face and your face. Yeah, well, what if sometimes is you've got all this up here, and you're trying to pick out the part that sort of makes most sense. So I think that's that that can be hard for me in terms of a, in terms of you know wanting to put in tons of detail, and it just takes practice. I think I, you know depending on the experience, some things are just really hard to talk about personally. The other other things are there's such so much going on. You're trying to figure out what exactly is a key is a key thing through all that. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not easy, but uh, it's your, your name is uh, Ron. So Ron, so he, uh, Ron, Ron's point was, you know, when you go back to write about an experience like that, it's a hard to express yourself, put it down. And I, and I think it is, it can be, because sometimes we're not uh, we're not used to sort of putting down our our version of what it is. We're in our, in our head, we're hearing voices the way it was from my brother, my sister, my mom, or something like that. But I would say, you know, when it's your story, you tell how you got you got you got to tell it. And uh, a related point to that that I would like to make it, is that uh, writing is like a muscle. And uh, in terms of that, uh, you know, keeping that journal, what, what, I, think, what I think it does, and it, it, it's, there's a physiological process in your brain. You, and I think I told this in class last year, so it's a bit creepy, but I, I, really, uh, I, I really feel it myself, is that when you write a piece of writing that's difficult, an assignment that's difficult, you're actually, there's chemical connections being made in your brain. I'm a, not the science guy, but you know, there's these little neuron pathways, all these little wiring that's getting beefed up when you're making yourself do the work. Just like if anybody here is an athlete, when you work out, you know, you, you push your muscles a little bit, and the muscles respond by creating, you know, more muscle to, to, to accomplish that greater workload. And it's the same thing with writing. And, uh, and I know that instinctively, when you get a hard assignment, the first thing you want to do is what's the easiest way to get it done, right? Why do I really got to make five pages? Kind of like my daughter did this last week. She's having to read her paper. It's like, why is the spacing like triple? You know, why are the margins in like this? Well, it's got to be three pages. But you guys, if you think your teacher won't at all, maybe think that that's what you're doing. She's trying to do that. But, um, you, you know, I told her, I said, it's like, I said, you know, in, in, in by in by working as hard on every assignment, making as good as you can be, it will be that much easier for you next time. You know, I was telling my daughter, I said, if you want to, if you want to get really good at free throws, anybody here plays basketball? Does anybody here play basketball? Good basketball player. Okay. So so if, if you want to shoot free throws, how many how many uh, or how many free throws in a row can you make? Do you think? I had a good day. I don't know. Five, ten, fifteen. Mm -hmm. I just depends. So, but but so let, let's say you want to make ten in a row. If you if you want to make ten free throws in a row, you won't go out and just shoot five, right? You know, you won't just shoot five free throws. And furthermore, like I tell her, you won't go out and just shoot any which way and say, well, it doesn't matter if I make them. Just I'm just shooting, right? So it's just kind of the same thing with with the writing. I mean, if, when you're going to do something, you know, you're going to try to make it as good as you can. And that quality, that quality, gets hard at the time. The next time you try to do it, you sort of up your game that much. You know, the, you, you strengthen your writing ability by just a little bit. So, I, to me, anyway, the, the, the next one is easier. And I, I found that on really hard assignments, it's almost like you are developing more muscle, more horsepower in your brain to sort of get that over the next time. That's how the body adapts. I mean, the body's a wonderful thing. You know, it adapts to exercise, it adapts to, just like it adapts to the climate now. It doesn't feel as cold, you know, it's gotten warm a few degrees and it feels better than it did last week. I mean, the body's adaptable, and if you give it some work to do, you keep it busy, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll do something for you. So um, that's a part of writing that I think uh, it seems hard, but actually it makes it easier. And in terms of in terms of the uh, the, the creative writing that I do now, um, 
because I, I would talk about my work, but you know, it's really early in the morning, and uh, some of you guys are kind of, so it's good work, I'm not thankful to do it, but I think, I think for me, um, the creative writing, in some ways, you know, when you're doing those essays in your freshman comp classes, and I don't know if they're, what they're like now, but it's usually some combination of personal experience or an essay or something like that, that's really what I do now, in terms of, you know, the book I wrote, the book particularly, the stuff I've done for, uh, National Public Radio, the account I do for nurse newspapers, is basically a personal essay. And the reason I like that so much is that uh, I have a master's degree in journalism, so I was trained to be a journalist. And journalism is great, but the journalist's job, to the extent possible, is to report a story. Okay, so there's, there's a fire in downtown Baton Creek, you know, and you've got to go down there and you've got to talk to the, uh, you know, Donna has one here, she did this, this great little piece on uh, on so you're going to go down there, your job is to tell people the news. You're going to talk to the fire department, you're going to talk to the police, you're going to talk to the store owner, you know, get three sources usually, and try to figure out what happened, you know, how much the damage was done to the store, is anybody hurt, what is the cause of it, you know, what do they think is going to, you know, when you're going to rebuild, this sort of thing. So you, so you put that out there, it's like a public service, right? It helps, it helps the public be well informed of what's going on. But as a writer, the more I did that, I was always like, you can never put I in a news story. You're not going to say, I went down to the back street and I talked to the police commissioner. It's like, you know, the fire on West Michigan Avenue yesterday, you know, you know, tore down a, you know, a, a historic two, two, two story building or something like that. I mean, the point is to uh, be this objective third party voice and just tell the story, not get in the way of it. And that's fine, but after a while, you know, um, I kind of got tired of that. And, and something else, I was working at the Kellogg Foundation, and this is really weird. Because I was a speechwriter, so I had to write speeches for the CEO. So I had to write like his voice. So I had to channel the voice of a guy who was had been like the president of John Hopkins University, you know, <laughs> so he had his PhD and everything. So you know, on one hand, I'm doing journalism where I don't have any voice whatsoever because I can't use the eye. Other hand, I've got to write for this you know, 65 year old guy from like Boston, all right. So you know, I've kind of had this weird experience where I feel like you know, maybe it's a bit like crisis. I don't feel like. I'm, having any sort of voice of my own, and uh, I started listening on the radio, uh, National Public Radio, that these little two-minute essay. I really liked those. And uh, in one of my journalism classes up at Michigan State, this guy came in, David Hammond, from a Great Lakes Radio Consortium, was called, and he said, you know, if you got an idea for one of these essays, you know, he said, you know, give me a call. You know, and, and a lot of times, and I'm not going to, I, I don't have a publication, so I can't offer this opportunity, but, you know, People will give talks, they'll say things like that. Hey man, just give me a call. So I thought, well, I'm gonna give you a call. So so I did, and I and I sent him an essay, it's about 500 words, which is about that's about it's about two pages double space if you actually really do double space. And uh, and it's about a two-minute essay. And I and I sent him something, he liked it, and I and I read it on the radio, and I and that was the start of my sort of career. And, but I think, I think what I liked about the essays is that they, they sort of have three components to them. And, and this sounds like a formula, it kind of is. But first of all, and you'll see this in your, in your, in your freshman account things, first has to be some sort of personal experience you found really interesting. Okay, something from your life that you saw or that you did that was personally interesting. Maybe, you know, maybe last week I saw this, uh, you know, these, these five cats attacked the dog and killed herself. Out there. So I saw these five cats attack this dog and kill it. I thought, whoa, because I'm really, a, I'm really a big cat lover, but all of a sudden all I, I could see that these cats really actually were feral beasts and they could be really nasty and mean and really rock my world because I have cats and you know my whole life where I was around my cats and all of a sudden here these cats have turned into these bloodthirsty killers that are you know, you know attacking this dog, right? So so that's your experience, right? And then the thing about a personal essay is that we can, we can get carried away with the personal part. It's just about our experience and our story. But really, what that experience has to do, it has to be a bridge to sort of wider reality, okay? So, it, 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 and I'm totally making this up as I go along. But I mean, I mean, in terms of the cat story, the, the principles I'm telling you are, are sort of established. So you start out with a story about this, this thing you saw with cats, and you've got to lead it into something bigger, right, that everybody can relate to. It, it maybe maybe. The story here is the fact that, you know, you know, the animal kingdom is something that we don't really understand very well. And it's something that's, that we have a lot of contradictory opinions about. I mean, we love, we love little, little bunnies and we love, you know, kittens and, 
the little calves and all that, but then we'll just sit there and eat our hamburger and read the story about these cute animals, right? And that hamburger came from something that is no longer with us, right? You know? So this is conflict in nature of people and animals, you know, and maybe you could maybe you could say something in there. Some interesting facts that I read doing some research. The fact that like 60% uh, of people that own pets, the pets sleep with them, you know, and that uh, compared to like 20, 30 years ago, a lot of pets have human names, where they used to be like Sparky and Sarge and Bud when I was a kid, and dogs slept outside, chained, they had a little dog house, you know, they were stinky, never came in the house. You know, a lot of people, you know, I was talking to a lady last week, you know, and she, uh, the story, she clips her cats with toenails. I didn't know you could do that, you know, so that's how she manages that. But I mean, that level of sort of connection to your cats, you know, you clip your toenails, it probably came to them afterwards. I don't know. So, so, so you, you had this experience where you saw this terrible thing, and it made you think, you know, but, but that's weird because, you know, all of a sudden, I see that these, this, this animals that we all love and care about, you know, it sort of underlies this larger sort of conflict that we have with animals in our lives. How we love them and think they're fuzzy, but all of a sudden, when they get bad and mean, they must die. You know, or we must have, we, we have to kill them to eat and survive. So, so there's that. So, in, in, in that part of the essay, you could talk about some of the facts. You know, how many people own pets in the country, the phenomenal amount of money that's spent on pets every year, how much of an industry it is, the fact that, that, that pets are even being, the pets are even being treated for things that people have, like, like depression, anxiety, ADHD, you know, which suggests to me that maybe the pet doesn't have a big problem as a person, right? You know, like, like, you know? So, so I mean, you, you could, but you pull that lens out bigger, then everybody can see themselves in the story. They may not be able to see the five cats attack the dog, but they can see that. Yeah, that's true. That, this kind of unbalanced thing. But the third part, which is really hard, that I never did. That, that I want to do, but I got out of journalism. In journalism, okay, I'm at the third part. It's, it's a point where I got, okay, what does this all mean? How do I make sense of this, right? Because that's what the essay does. It has, it has this, what I call this wisdom moment. It's got this personal experience. It's got some sort of factual grounding where you're talking, you know, you're sharing some broad information about pets and this sort of crazy back and forth dichotomy we have. And then, then the last part, the last part, it doesn't have to be last, but often it is, is when you have what I call a wisdom moment. You've got to sum it up for everybody. You got to sell. So what does this all mean? You know, and, and when you're a journalist, you know, you just, you know, Google, you know, cat psychologist or something like that. You would call that person up. You would call an expert up there, you know, and you, you would you would get their take on why these animals behave in the way they do. But I think with an essay, it, it's sort of up to you to maybe uh, to, to sort of figure it out for people, you know, to figure out what that is, and. Um, and th that's the hard part. Sometimes you get it right away and sometimes you don't. You can't really fake it. I, th I think that's why the essay writing for me has, has been easier the more experience I've had in life because you can kind of make sense of, it, sense of things. So, you know, the, the summing up for that may be that, you know, uh, you know, animals have their place. I've seen that, that bumper sticker, you know, right next to the steak and potatoes or whatever, mashed potatoes. But, I, it, you know, you would have to come up with some way of making sense of that for people in their lives. So maybe. You know, maybe maybe what it means is that I now realize that little Fluffy's my cat and she loves me and, and, and she's my pet, but inside, deep inside, she's still got this beating heart of the fierce tiger or something. So the next time I see her kill my bird, I'll just sort of let that go and know I gotta live with it, okay? So that, that's, that's, that's a pretty bad example, but that, that's kind of what essay writers do. And, and, uh, and you know, Elizabeth talked about that earlier about sort of that sense of wonder. I think, that, and I think that's what it grows out of, that sense of reflecting, you know, so what does this all mean? You know, we all do that in our lives anyway. And I think, I think with essay writing, we get to do that on paper. But again, the big point for me that I had to overcome, when I went from journalism writing to writing an essay to win that book, I first did that, the series of essays for as a graduate program at Michigan State, you know, and I, and I go in to see my graduate advisor, and she's like, well, you're out of those essays, but they're like way too personal. There's too much on them. I said, well, these are personal essays, man. Get it? <laughs> personal essays about my life. And she made that subtle connection that I sort of go from one extreme to the other. I went from journalism, where the writer's not supposed to be there at all, to me just sort of talking about myself in the corner, which is fine if you're doing a diary, but really for an essay, you have to sort of connect people to it. So that, that's a subtle difference. But um, there's a lot of you read more essays, you kind of see how you can do that. So uh, I've been talking quite a bit. I don't know if anybody has any question about a paper or anything they're working on or any sort of question about the process that, that I could answer. Do you have any advice for finding a constructive analysis or a slate? 
this descriptive adjectives, you mean like, like you're trying to describe what? What's something you've been trying to describe? Um, I guess I have trouble describing more like feelings. Like I'm writing on paper, I don't know what how I feel about these details. Right. Like I'm trying to describe. Well, I, I think the, the, the thing about describing stuff is that it's so easy to jump to the, to the, to the, uh, to the classic, to the cliche that you've heard all the time. Like if you some, say something is warm and you're swimming, you're going to say it's as warm as what? What do people say? The lake is as warm as bath water. People say that. Or these things are selling like whatever. Or it's so easy to jump to these cliches that, that we always hear a million times used to describe things. You know, it's, especially in sports. Anybody that's sports right, you know, there's a million cliches for all that. But I think you have to try to think a little differently. You know, maybe it's a woman's bath later, but maybe it's as warm as, as, a, as a drunk girl's kisses or something. I don't know. You know what, what's up? It's not good. I mean, you have to. Uh, you, you have. You have to. You have, so if what's come, what's going to come to mind first is the stuff you hear all the time, right? So try try to think some more about that. And I think I think something else is is to look at that. So you're going to always look at this tree. Okay, so look at this tree. So here's this, here's this black cherry tree. It's, it's a native tree. And, uh, and you see the bark on this tree, and you look at it closely, it looks like burnt potato chips, okay? So just use a little bit of imagination and look at the thing. How would I describe this to somebody? Maybe how would I describe this to a kid? Some of you can't see. How would I describe it to them? You know, and try to find those comparisons that everybody can relate to. And I think when you start to do that, then you've done the work of really breaking free the Conventions of how everybody's going to say something, and you're seeing it in a way that I think people can get. So, I don't, I don't any anything else in the woods that you were, you mean what it looks like, or trying to make sense? Yeah, of it? like trying to describe how it looks like instead of like simple adjectives, right? Color, I want to be more expressive. Right, you want to be more expressive. So, yeah. so you, you think of things, you think of things that, um, think of things that remind you of something else. But again, don't go to the first one. Just try to, th try to think harder, you know? And I think a lot of times, you're trying to use a lot, you know, maybe more. More isn't always better than just try to find the right one, you know? It's like the difference between lightning, which is and lightning, like lightning or load. I mean, there's some fine nuances. And I would say, two just read good writers who, who, are, who do that stuff really well. And, and you'll see that, you know, people like Andy Gill or whoever, that when they come up with this stuff, it's like, how did you ever come up with that? But once you start getting a hammer to make yourself do it, then I think it will get a little bit easier. Yeah. Can I speak to that also? Because I can't help it. <laughs> yeah. I just think also, um, instead of looking for better adjectives sometimes, you want to find really good verbs that do the job so you're not just is, are, was it. That's really boring. But get some really evocative verbs and then, you know, be some of the adjectives. Yes, that's it. They're the verbs. So. Things that don't really, uh, things that you won't think of, of describing, you know, like I, th I think people cover sports and sports events are like that. They seem like they're stuck in the script of how they got right about this basketball game, or this basketball match, or something like that. You know? and breaking out of that, you know, I, I think it's, it really sets you apart as a writer. It gives your writing a little bit different. And all it takes is, again, do a little more work. You know? and, uh, but that word choice is very important. Any other, anybody else work on anything? They got a question? Yes, sir. Uh, so, could you give me some good advice on how to critique a uh, scholarly article? A scholarly article? Do you have to do it like as another scholar where you've got to, you've got to say? Uh, it's just for uh, my sociology class. You've got to critique it? <laughs> <laughs> you just got to critique like an article. And what, what's your article on? Uh, I'm doing my. So there's an article on how to become a pilot. Uh, I mean, I just made it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, can I clarify? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm their teacher. I made them ask that question. So they actually they're doing uh, they're doing a journal article critique. Um, they're finding something that they're interested in um, sociologically and just critiquing somebody else's work, like just pulling up journal articles. They're trying they're trying to personalize sociology. And find a topic that they're interested in, um, but it's so broad. 
advice on how to kind of help them uh, choose a topic or take a look at an article that they would personalize? Well, well, I think, first of all, you teach me this brief. I think you got the permission to be funny. Okay? If you think you're going to sit there and be, you know, Dr. James Fields, that's the fruit of research at the ABA for Sciences, the parameters are, you know, whatever. You're going to say, you know, as somebody who wants to be a pilot, I read this and I couldn't figure out why this guy would ever want to write this article. You know, as exciting to me as it sounds like to be in an airplane, tank for the tank for the sky, and all the wonders of flight. You know, I get none of this when I read this article. You know, where's all that joy at, man? What happened to you? You know, or something. I mean, that, that's a little sarcastic, but you can look at it with a fresh eye and try to say, or maybe you really find a point somewhere that's buried on page 10. So what this guy is really saying, what he's really saying is that, uh, um, this is interesting, because this is a point that I came across in my reading last year on, on some other subject. I used to be a, a military journalist in the National Guard. You know what I found with pilots? Before they, they fly an airplane, they have to do this pre-flight check. So they have these really thick booklets where they're supposed to go around and kick the tires and wobble the wings and knock on the cockpit or whatever else to make sure all these things are holding together that are really important when you're in the sky on an airplane. And uh, what these guys said, they did a study of these veteran pilots, and they found out that these guys did not do these pre-flight checks anymore. You know, which is kind of startling, thinking, oh, that's great, you know, you're just getting this airplane, you're not doing it. And they were sort of, they were sort of not really comfortable admitting that because this is like, this is the, the Bible where you're supposed to go around this airplane, make all this, look through this book, page after page, and do all these checks. And what they found out was that these guys, they had actually had internalized. In other words, they'd done this so much that they didn't need the book anymore. Now, they didn't tell anybody that, but that really, that really spoke to what a good pilot was, where they knew this airplane so well, they knew this flying so well, that they could actually do this and use more of their gut feeling to fly this airplane as opposed to using all that sort of science. So, you know, may, maybe when you, when you read something, you start, you, you read it over a couple of times, and you try to figure out the contact, content, then you try to find out, is there some underlying emotion or some underlying thing that's not being said here? Or why does this, why is this person taking this point of view? I don't know if that helps at all, but, but if there's something in there that you can sort of riff on, you find a comment on there that you really find incomprehensible or crazy or really cool, and sort of start with that, but it's, it's got to be something that when you read through it, what really jumps out at you? What really jumps out at you? And this is another part, this is our comparison. So if you were, if you were a monk in a monastery, you would, you would practice something called Lectio Divina. And what they do, it's, that's, that's the same sort of practice that you use for reading scriptures. I mean, you can, you can study the Bible a lot of different ways, but their practice is to open up, open up the Bible and read it until they come upon a certain passage or certain verse of scripture that really speaks to them. Okay, and at that point, they stop and reflect on that, what that really is. So, you know, they're not just reading for information. They're not reading just for information, for inspiration. They're reading until they feel that they're touched in some way by some part of this writing. And they would say that it's the spirits move them to pay attention to that. That sort of forms the basis of other meditation or reflection on that. And I think in some writing, we find some level. Okay, you're going you're gonna to find something in the art that nobody else does, okay? Maybe it's, maybe it's crazy. Maybe it makes you mad. Maybe it makes you angry. You know, whatever. And uh, if you read the article, nothing comes up like that, you know, I'd say get another article. Until you can find something you can reflect on that makes sense to you, and then just sort of build out, build out of that. Okay, how long is your paper going to be? You know? uh, yeah, two to three days. Double, triple space, double space? <laughs> so so that, that's the first thing, is, is find an article that, that's you. Because I think it's good that your teacher isn't assigning you specific things. That makes it hard. You know, so... You know, read several of these things. And you can probably read an abstract of the article, right? You know, they have to read the abstract, see if that does anything for it, then they read for it. And look for something, whether it's funny, stupid, interesting, whatever. Whatever really sort of moves you. And, uh, you know, good luck with that. You, know? you could do it. Anybody else have more questions? More coffee back there.
point, that's exactly what it is. Almost I've said it's like one point one plus one equals three, right? Okay, it's not like journalism where okay, if I'm stuck, I get more facts, I talk to an expert, I get some more stuff in here. It's the fact I'm really trying to sum it up. And that is almost yeah, you get the feel you don't know where you're going. And but your subconscious is working this problem. I totally believe that. Your subconscious has an answer. Somewhere out there, there's a connection to this. And writing your way to it. It is. All of a sudden, you'll get an ending and it's kind of flat. You'll just, no, it's not. That's not it. And you'll write it again and it'll help you. And you, when you get it, you really get it. You know? And I've had some that, um, that I never quite got it right, so I had to kind of think it at the end. And you know which ones those are inside you. There's other ones where it just pops up at you and it's right there. You know, even Stephen King, everybody's heard of Stephen King, you know, multi million dollar writer, all kind of stuff. Probably more successful, I think, in terms of books sold than anybody owns, or genre stuff. Even he's. He, he tends to think that, that the, the, the plots he writes about in his books, that he says they already exist in his mind somewhere in the universe. And his job, like an archaeologist, is try to uncover these things. So I probably have brushing away the dirt without getting the whole pot out without having to crack. And he says sometimes you can't unearth the whole thing in the story without getting out this right. Other times it comes out sort of perfect. But I think human beings have a built-in sort of it's part of our nature. We want to make sense of it. You know, we're trying to, we try to figure out what, you know, this relationship ended, I lost his job, all of a sudden there's a sickness in my family, there's this death, there's this problem. What does this all mean? Why does this happen to me? You know, that, that's part of our existential aspect. We're trying to figure out why we're here, what we're about, what, what, what we're supposed to do with our lives. And a little bit of that comes in message because this experience happened to me, and I'm really trying to figure out why that morning in the alley, the five cats are trying to kill the dog. You know, why was I picked to see that man? What does it mean? You know? So, so that's sort of like that's sort of like your job as a writer. Now, if you don't like to write, that's just about as painful as having your fingernails pulled out with pliers, right? If people don't like to write; they hate that. Okay. But for people who like to write, like words and like stories, it's just like you, you just want to get that meaning for that. And uh, I, I think uh, what time is this? It's, uh, it's, it's, what I was gonna what, what I was gonna do was read uh, uh, one of the essays that, that I wrote recently. And uh, this, this is an example to me of how, uh, what I love about personal essay writing is this, this stuff happens in your life. And you're like, this, this, this is a really a powerful coincidence that happened in my life. You know, and coincidence especially that lead to something. You're saying, what, what was I supposed to do? It, it really makes you feel like you're there for a reason. This, in this case, this personal instance, I was put there for a reason. I met this person for this reason. but. I'll never really know exactly what that reason was for, so I have to sort of, in that summing up, come to this part of it. And, um, and I can say more about this afterwards. And, 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 I, and I would say that it was really hard to boil this down into something this short, because I started out with this thing, it was really long, there's a lot more stuff to it. And when I write this for my next book, it'll probably be expanded, but for a newspaper copy, you've got like X amount of room, right? I mean, they, they don't give you, they don't say, okay, you've got twice as long as we can sort of stuff. So this is called uh, From the War of the Woods, Thanksgiving Homecoming. It was, I suppose, a coincidence, although in the way of coincidences, there was a whiff of the mystical about it. It started at 5 a.m. in Albuquerque, where I'd gone for a business trip. I had a plane to catch, but the dry air, okay, and some beers the night before, had given me a headache. I dug around in my grungy shaving kit for some ibuprofen, but, but no luck. But I did find something useless to my hungover condition, a little mirror blazing with the Big Dipper, bayonet, and mountain insignia of the Army's 172nd Infantry Brigade. It was a souvenir from a long ago visit to Fort Richardson, Alaska. I was in the National Guard then, so the mirror came in handy for shaving the field. So here's this thing that I hecked around in my shaving kit for some reason forever, right? I mean, I stay in hotels now. I don't need to be out in the field and use this little shaving kit. You know, from what you here in the military, you know, put on a camouflage paint, you know, so I had this thing. So I said, great, I muttered with throbbing temples. How come I'll drag around crap like this for 25 years but can't remember to buy any animals? In short order, I find out. My flight stopped in Atlanta to wait my connection to Grand Rapids. There at my departure gate, a soldier stood transfixed near a TV running story in Afghanistan. You see plenty of soldiers at this airport, near as it is at Fort Bennett. It's a big infantry training base. Uh, their usually private freshman basic training is gangland hyper with spring colts. There's an example of trying to think about something different. I really worked on it. Here's these guys, and they're just 
tall, skinny, and then they've been in basic training for 13 weeks, and you see them at the airport, and it's like, oh man, I get to be not treated like a prisoner for the first time in months. They're just all apart, bopping around, you know, and they're usually got enormous, you know, coats, and they're, they're just sort of living it up. And they have that, they, they have that feeling in me of sort of like little bouncy coats out the pasture. Anyway. But uh, so they're usually private special basic trainees, gangly and hyper with spring colts. Not this trooper. His boots are run down. His fatigue frayed and grimy, his neck burned angry by a fierce sun. The look on his face said it all disgust, resignation, exasperation, and soul crushing fatigue. He might as well have combat vet written across his forehead with a sharpened pen. Then, as he wearily shook his head and turned away, I saw on his left shoulder was a unit patch with a bayonet, Big Dipper, and mountains. No freaking way, I thought, recalling the mayor. Of all the people in this airport, so this is busy airport land. The guy next to me is in the 172nd Infantry. Uh, I mean, there's, there's probably, what, 400,000 people in the Army in this unit. I don't know, there's probably 20, 30,000. So of all the places where this, this guy was next to me really struck me as being sort of, okay, I got this feeling, this is, this is just, something's going to happen here, right? And, and uh, minutes later, we both got in line for the same flight to Grand Rapids. And on the plane's 200-odd passengers, guess whose seat is next to that? So the funnel is sort of coming together, right? This big airport, I'm next to this guy, all of a sudden next, the next point of the funnel. We're going on this, we're getting on this airplane again. Next point of the funnel. I'm going to be set next to this guy in the airplane. So it was really you know, kind, of, kind of creepy. So once aboard, Alex was eager to talk. Forty hours earlier, he'd been on a bare ass mountain in Afghanistan, reachable only by helicopter and Taliban fighters. Its red dust still clung to his fatigues. And as Alex spoke aboard, his voice, Tense and oddly detached, sounded as if he was still there. And this next part was hard because I'm not taking notes, you know. I'm just hearing this guy tell a story, so I'm trying to approximate what I think he said. You know, this man on Thanksgiving Day, we were taking sniper fire. So I opened up the Ma Deuce, parenthesis 50 caliber sheet gun. The concussion had me bouncing off the rocks. Then we called in artillery and CBUs. He's using all these lingo for his war terms, right? A while later, the chopper radio said, You just spent about $2 million to kill one guy. And um, I couldn't put this in here, but what really struck me at the time was his was the voice of somebody who was still at war, okay? Because, you know, he was on this mountain. He caught one helicopter, another helicopter, from the combat zone, going back, because halfway into your one-year tour, you get, you get a, a two-week leave back in the States, right? So here a guy, fighting <coughs> for his very life, is all of a sudden, he's getting this re-entry, and it's like, it's just so abrupt and so quick, you know? He doesn't even have time to change his clothes. When he talks to me about a war, the war, it's like, you know, I'm there in that hill next to me, okay? So, um, that's not in here, but pick up the, the essay again. I can listen to war stories all day, but something told me that wasn't why I had been placed here beside him. He badly needed to prepare his heart for home. So, I ventured, you're going to hunt deer during your leave? Are you kidding me? He blurted out, I'll be out tomorrow morning. Me and my dad built this great barn. It's like an apartment. He owns an archery shop. I love the bull hunt. And, uh, you know, this really got me. So I really don't want to touch a gun while I'm at home. And I can imagine that. So, uh, no, I suppose not. So for a half hour, we kind of re-steered the conversation. We spoke instead of sacred mission, of secret lakes and fat bluegills, of silvery coal and the pure Marquette, of cagey bucks and wily turkeys, things he knew, loved, and yes, could hunt and kill with a modicum of grace. As the conversation eased, I noticed something hopeful. The timbre of Alex's voice had lowered a few registers. To speak again of the North Woods had been a restful time. I dare say he began to sound more like himself, more Michigan boy than paratrooper. You could almost hear the rustle of white pines creep back into his voice. As we neared Grand Rapids, I gave Alex a mirror, but it was anticlimactic. The real mirror had been a hungover stranger, one who helped him reflect on the wild green salvation of home. So, so that's a gift. I mean, you, you, to me, that is the whole point of honing your sort of your writing abilities is when something comes to you like that that, you know, I figure out the way on to write about it. But it's so wonderful that, you know, you want the world to know about it. And I think the world should know about it. The world should know about what these young men are going through, the, you know, the, the drama, the trauma of their life, what it's back to try to re enter back into your civilian world after that sort of horror, you know. And they should know, too, that, you know, 
just a brief experience I had that, that know that maybe there's things at home that can help them heal, that can make them whole again, that there's some hope for them. I think put, put in that way, if you're a person who's a writer and you get put in that position, I think you have some sort of a, almost an obligation to try to tell that story. If you have an obligation to use you know, your God-given abilities to tell stories and try to get that out there with somebody else. Now, you know, I don't know, I don't know who read this, I don't know what would become of it, but you can't worry about that. You just have to worry about getting it down as best you can, you know, and put the story out there and sort of let it just work. And, and I think the gift that you gave that bet was it took his mind off that situation. The, you know, for that short period of time, he still went back on. Right, it. exactly. Maybe he felt good about what he was. Maybe momentarily, but he still Exactly. He's still got a lot of stuff to work yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, of But, you know, when I got in the airport, I didn't put this in there. I landed, you know, in a, and here his family was there with him. You know, and I thought, you know what? For him to be that guy who's just so buzzed up and war in combat to really meet his family. I mean, hopefully that was just my little thing, just enough to sort of bring him down a little bit, because he was wired, man. You know, enough to where he could, you know, maybe re-enter a little bit. But uh, just to feel yourself be part of that process, and like, whoa, I just been plopped here and doing this. I mean, it was really cool. But uh, I don't know, but other than this, this, this humble little personal essay, I don't, I don't know how else to sort of communicate as a physical writer. I mean, you could try to do it as a journalist or something. But, but anyway, that, that's the power of words. That's the power of writing. You know, that's the power of, of, of living a life where you pay attention to what's going on and you write things down that mean something to you, you know, to make you make more sense to it, help other people make more sense of things. Yeah. So, did you know this was an essay as it was happening, partway into it, only afterwards? You know, that, that, that's, that's kind of creepy because when you're a writer, you're not like trying to be so exploitative of human beings. You say something really cool so I can make this good <laughs> essay, you know? So, I, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't, uh, it was kind of unfolding at the time, right? And I think probably by the time I was driving home, I really said, what just happened? What was that experience? And I knew I had to write about it. It was really hard because I had a lot of conflicting emotions about it. And, uh, you know, so, you know, depending on what you're doing, you, you might know that going through. But yeah, how, how do you sort of balance, I don't know about you, but how do you balance that? It's something you know you want to write about, but obviously, you know, I've got to really respect the person, the story and everything. But um, I, can't, I, I think, I think I, yeah, anyway, short answer, it made sense on the way home. I, I, I landed in Grand Rapids at the airport. I was trying to figure out the way home, so, well, you know. What can experiences for halfway through it, but like, oh, I should start taking notes on Yeah. But of course, you don't want to do that, so it's all like, yeah, I think I'm still listening to you, but I'm secretly writing. Secret, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> the, the, yeah, I think what you do, I found, is, I'm not a very good note taker or thing like that. It's just try to live the moment, try to live the experience, okay? Because it's really, it's really the reflecting on it later that will sort of give you that drama. And I, uh, and I, I have an essay here looking for history. We got this old house in the country, and I had this 150 year old bar. We had planned a story in an arson party, you know, and coming out that next that night, dog bar, bar 200 feet away, totally engulfed in flames, deathly quiet January night, really cold, no wind. I can feel the heat in my throat, like whoa, this is. So powerful, the barn's all just looks ghastly black, and here's these flames. This is evil, man. You know, and so you know, I got the kids and the wife to laugh because we had like a big LP gas tank between the barn and the house. I don't know if it blew up or not, but I want to stick around and find out. You know, and coming back the next day, and of course, you know, and, and cleaning up the, the uh, remnants of the barn, still smoking and everything. And, you know, my mom asked me, "Are you going to write about this?" And I said, uh, "It's time." I'm like, "No, oh, I'm not print that up now." Jeez, you know how mercenary can you get? But, but she was right and ended up that I did write about it along with us in the book. But at the time, it was it would have been just too much to go around and try to say, okay, you know, take a note that in fact when we were cleaning up the hay, we found like a witch shot that was trying to get out, and just sort of like <laughs> charred and mid stride, you know, stuff like that. You know, I think the thing is just live your life, man. You know, maybe, maybe you take take notes for a journal, and I do that sometimes, and for the most part. If you really pay close attention and, and capture what's going on in those vivid memories, you know, the, then you'll, I think you'll, uh, you'll be able to do it later. But, but if you got to take little notes, maybe, you know, that's your job, man, you know. Yeah. Hey, how do you come up with your descriptions? Like, you know, you describe the soldier, how he's going to be in that hole. Right. I mean, things like that, but I mean, that don't come to me. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't, I don't think like that. If I see him, oh, man. Well, I'm just thinking about, you know, okay, I'm looking at this guy, and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, that's that's a word, grimy, grungy, 
analogy, and I was, and I was thinking, okay, is fatigue, you know, it's just really, I, I, first of all, it, that come from just being, you know, writing and drawing your hand? It comes from writing, it comes from something I know about, you know, I was never in combat, I was in the National Guard for 20 years, so, I don't know what you know real well, Ron. There's some subjects you probably know better than somebody else. I don't know what the fuck that would be. I mean, what's an example? Yeah, we'll get into that. Okay, we'll get into that. But that thing that you know about, yeah. that thing you know about, you know details about that nobody else does. Okay? I mean, I know when I take my card out here to Jeremy Muffer Man, you know, when I go down there and he looks at, he looks at my brakes, to me they're just squeaking. When he takes that wheel off, he can say, oh man, I can see the dust on there from that caliper. I can see that little bit of oil leaking. You know, the things you, you say about writing about what you know, because the things you know about tend to be things that you love. The things that you love, whether it's people or things, you have paid very close attention to those things, okay? And if, 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 a, if, a, job, if a writer has any, anything, anything about the job that you're being a writer, pay close attention. So I think that's what it is. You pay close enough attention that you see those, those details. And once you see those details, it's a matter of fact of picking the right words to describe. But I think it starts with the scene of the details. You know, and I, when I saw this guy, I'm like, I know this guy. You don't look like, I mean, the look on his face is you know from everything. It, it, it said, this man has come extremely tired from a long, difficult journey, you know what I mean? So, I mean, you could probably, you know, if you went down to the bus station, people won't like it very much. But you could probably look at them and pay close enough attention where there's a little story, the way they're dressed, the way some, some woman's there with her kids and having to leave or something, you know? But it's, it's just paying attention, and again, the more you know something, I think, the more you can <coughs>
just be, they cannot be a topic, okay? You've got to, you've got to develop from that topic a real narrow theme. And from that theme, there's almost a sliver of some experience that you have. So just try to focus it down more, down that, down that sort of funnel, I guess. And I don't know, if you, do you have an example of one that you, that you, that was really long, that you could make short, that you're working on now?